you know, I'm a good person, right? Like, I'm sure we all say that to ourselves. Like, I'm a good person and I'm kind to people and I have always been so grateful for life. And, yeah. you know, why me? Why did this happen to me? Why did it have to rock my world? Yeah. Um, you know, that I have so much anger. Um, I think I've gone through every emotion, grief, anger, denial. Mm-hmm. I haven't gotten to acceptance yet. <laughs> yeah. Welcome everyone to another episode on the podcast of the Heart Warrior Project. My name is Elis Vaas and I'm a fellow cardiac arrest survivor and your host here on this show. I created the Heart Warrior Project to offer more emotional support out there to other survivors. It's a crazy ride uh, having to go through this. And often there's little to no emotional support given to us, which doesn't make this journey any easier. In this episode, I got to welcome cardiac arrest survivor Brooke Jones, who survived a cardiac arrest about a year ago. Now, this was an emotional conversation, but also a very important one, as it shows the true side of what it's like to have to deal with being a cardiac arrest survivor. The changes it can bring to one's life are many. Learning to deal with this new life that we have been given so suddenly is it, it, it's confusing, hard, and oftentimes just messy to navigate through. But yet we all go on, don't we? We go on fighting, we go on trying to make sense of it all, and we try to improve our lives as much as we can. Still, it's a battle, uh, one that each one of us cardiac arrest survivors goes through. And this episode shows beautifully that battle, that struggle. And it's not always pretty. It's rarely pretty, that struggle. And I am really grateful that Brooke was able to be vulnerable in this episode and show that side of being a cardiac arrest survivor. Now, some of the things we talk about in these episodes are, of course, how and why Brooke had a cardiac arrest. We also talk about being a new mom, the struggles of being a parent after surviving a cardiac arrest, living with all the what ifs and whys, what she feels people who have not gone through this don't really understand, and just so much more. In the show notes, which are located in the description of this episode, you can find any resources mentioned. And if you can't find the show notes that way, you can also simply go directly to heartwarriorproject.com slash podcast and search for Brooke. Lastly, I do truly have to apologize for some very strange technical issues that my recording software caused. At times when Brooke talks and I say something or, or even make a small noise, uh, she gets cut off. This shouldn't have happened, uh, yet it did. I have no idea why. Uh, so I am truly sorry. Um, but hopefully it will not bother you too much. It also doesn't happen all the time. Having said all that, I hope you will find some tips, advice and support in this episode with Heart Warrior Brooke Jones. Brooke, a uh, warm welcome here to the podcast of the Heart Warrior Project. I am truly yeah, grateful that you, you were able to take time to do this. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I read uh, a few days ago that you celebrated your uh, rebirth day. Yep, first one. How did you celebrate it? Uh, really, just had a quiet day. I think I had put a lot of pressure on it to be this big thing. But uh, my husband and I took our daughter to the playground and just got some fresh air. And then we went out and had a really nice dinner um, with my parents. And nice. they got me cake and flowers and a balloon. And it was just, it was a nice, but, but kind of quiet and peaceful celebration. But you enjoyed it, right? Absolutely. It was a yeah. special day. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. The balloon, uh, nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so this is, yeah, now I'm curious now to also ask just what happened like a year ago, you know, like how, how did this all start? Like where, yeah, when you had a cardiac arrest, um, and also like who saved you in the end? Sure. Yeah. How did we get here? Um, exactly. (laughs) I, and, and most of this is just what I've been told because like, like everyone else, I really don't have any memory from 
day. I remember bits and pieces, but so it was November 28th, 2021. It was a Sunday. Um, I was just home. I, I didn't even leave the house that day. It was a quiet day. Um, our daughter was four months old at the time and I had a friend who came over to meet her for the first time. And my husband had a friend over to watch football that day. And I remember bits and pieces of visiting with my friend. Um, I remember standing on the back porch and talking to her for a few minutes. And then I remember walking her to the door and her leaving. And then that's it. I remember nothing else from the day. So apparently I must have been feeling a little bit jittery or off because I told my husband I was going to go change into my pajamas and get in bed and lay down. So I went and I got in bed and I was just laying in bed with my daughter and I texted my husband and I said, hey, come here. And so he came back and I guess at that time I told him I wasn't feeling well. And I'm sure he said to me, you're fine, just press, you know, nothing's wrong. I called my parents and I, they said that I was very agitated and very, um, they described it as just being ramped up. I was just kind of rambling to them. And, and you don't remember that at all? Not one no. bit. Remember okay. at, um, they said I was just very anxious about a lot of things that were going on. And right before I hung up with them, I said, I think I'm going to get sick. So mm -hmm. that was the last thing I said to my parents, um, apparently. Oh. And they said, okay, we'll talk to you later. Feel better. So I texted my husband again and I said, hey, can you come back here? And he came from the other room again. He said at that point he found me coughing and I said I was overheating. I was fanning myself um, and I just was kind of in a, a fit of coughing and mm, yeah. just shallow breathing. So he still thought, Maybe she's having a panic attack or who knows, sometimes before I get sick, I, I do get hot. So he, again, he didn't really think that anything was wrong with me, but he went to go tell his friend, hey, you got to go home so I can take care of my wife. And he wasn't gone but a minute. And then he came back and I was face down unconscious in the shower. Wow. So he immediately thought I was just <clears throat> laying there. He didn't know I was unconscious. So he said to me, Brooke, that get up off of the shower floor. And when I didn't answer, he kind of knew something was wrong. So yeah, yeah. at that point, he rolled me over. He said I was gray and I was foaming at the mouth. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So he knew he didn't know how bad it was, obviously, but he knew pretty quickly that something was wrong with me. Sure. And luckily, um, his parents, my in-laws, live very, very close by. So he immediately called his mom and said, hey, something's wrong with Brooke. You need to come over and watch our baby. So they rushed right over. And in the meantime, he was calling 911. And he said, something's wrong with my wife. She's not breathing. Um, and they immediately started him on chest compressions. So he was doing chest compressions um, for a good while before the paramedics got there. And then it was a whole... Thing. It was, they sent five police cars, two ambulances, and a fire Whoa. truck. Whoa. Yeah. My neighbors must have thought, what in the world is going on <laughs> in the house? I mean, what a, what a dramatic scene. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, they finally all got there, and they took over the chest compressions. Mm -hmm. And um, they estimate that I was down for a little more than 10 minutes at that point. Mm -hmm. And they whisked me off in the ambulance. And then on the ride to the hospital, I suffered another slight cardiac arrest. Wow. And they were able to pretty quickly revive me from that one. So I got to the hospital and my family had no idea what was going on at this point. Um, and finally, they called my husband and told him where I was and what was going on. And of course, he rushed right over. Hmm. And at some point during that night, I don't know how short of a time span it was, but I had a third cardiac arrest. Yeah. What? Yeah. They they were actually on their way to take me to the cath lab to do testing to figure out what had caused the first two. And I went sure. into a pretty severe cardiac arrest at that point. 
And that time I was down for another about six minutes before they could bring me back. Wow. Yeah. So they um, they brought me back. I I woke up at some point very, very agitated again. And I had been intubated at that point. And apparently I tried to rip it out of my throat. And I was screaming and yelling and just violently reacting. Yep. Of course, don't remember any of this. But it was to the point where they had to restrain me and cuff yep. me to the hospital bed. So when my husband came in and found me <laughs> cuffed to the hospital bed, he, you know, I mean, what a sight for him to see. Wow. That's so crazy, right? Yeah. 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 And how I don't remember any of it. That's, that's what's yeah. crazy to me, you know? Mm. Yeah. So that's pretty much what happened. And then um, because I was so agitated and because they didn't really know what was going on, they placed me into a medically induced coma. Yep. So I was in a coma for almost three days. Mm -hmm. And um, when they finally brought me out, it's funny because my husband and I laugh about this. It was during COVID times. Like COVID was really, really bad. And the first thing I said to him when I woke up was COVID because that was the only thing in my mind that I could think <laughs> I would be in the hospital. But he said to me, no, it was your heart. He said, I just looked at him with this panic and just confusion on my face because I've never had a heart issue in my life. I'm a perfectly healthy young person. So, and he couldn't even explain to me at the time what had happened because they didn't really know yet. They had mm. still had to run some additional testing, but um, yeah, I mean, I just, and I don't even remember waking up from the coma and I don't remember my initial conversation with him, but um, you know, he just told me that I was just completely, confused how did i get here you know for sure right yeah yeah ah, okay yeah i because mine happened also during COVID. actually uh, i was also in the hospital during corona which uh how was it for you actually because for me no one was able to visit me so it was yeah. quite lonely actually also yeah. it was it was very lonely and at the time my mom actually had COVID very very bad oh whoa she was so sick that she doesn't even really remember what happened to me either because she was just in a daze. Um, mm. she, she remembers vaguely, but so that was really hard because my own mom and dad couldn't even come visit me. Um, yeah. I had her as well. She wasn't allowed to visit me. Mm. So it was just my husband, which at the time was fine because he was the person that, you know, he had saved my life. So I wanted him there with me as much as possible. Mm-hmm. But when he would go home at night, it was just me and the nurses who were wonderful, but you couldn't see their faces. And it was scary. It was lonely. Um, I missed my daughter. You know, she was only four months old at the time. And I a whole week away from her. And that, to me, was just torture. How does it feel, actually, for you to share this again, like this it story? I'm sure you've shared it to quite some people, but still, how does it feel? Yeah, share it again. I, it's still so fresh that it, it's it's emotional to talk about. And yeah. um, sometimes, though, when I tell the story, it doesn't even feel like it's my story. Yeah, it's, right. I mean, it, it feels like I'm telling someone else's story or a plot of a movie. I mean, it just doesn't feel like it's my life. Yeah, but it's emotional for sure. Uh, I, I have so many questions. It's like also <laughs> like... How crazy that you, I mean, you had a daughter of four year, four months. How was just the recovery? Like, is, when you recover, you, you don't feel great, right? I mean, for the first couple of months, you feel like really bad and memory issues can be a real problem. But four months old daughter still needs a lot of care too. Like, how, how did those first months kind of look? It was so hard because when mm. I got home from the hospital, they told me I couldn't even lift her because I had the cardiac catheterization and it was, you know, oh, yeah. uh, they said, you really can't strain yourself. You can't bend, you can't lift anything heavier than whatever pounds. Um, and she obviously weighed more than that at that point. So they said, you literally have to go home to your child who you've been away from for a week Aww. and you can't pick her up. Uh, that wow. Wow. It was so emotional. Um, uh -huh. And then, of course, like you said, she had a lot of needs at that point. And 
you know, thankfully, I have all my parents are nearby and my husband's parents are very nearby. So we had tremendous family support. And my husband, of course, is just so hands on with her. And he really was able to take over a lot of of what she needed. But um, it was it was definitely hard. I mean, he would have to pick her up and put her very carefully in my arms as to not strain. And, you know, your chest is so sore from mm-hmm. all impressions, right? So mm. I could hardly move without wincing in pain. Um, yeah, it was just, it was a crazy time. And the doctor had said to me before I left the hospital, he said, you need to slow down because before that I was go, go, go all the time. Taking sure. up all night, uh, not resting during the day. I mean, I was just going so much. I wasn't eating. I wasn't taking care of myself. And he said, you can't do that when you get home. And I didn't know how to not be that way. I was so into the routine of, of just doing everything. And, um, you know, it's our first baby. I wanted to just be part of every single thing and I had to take a step back and that was really hard. And I, even though I know it wasn't my fault, I have a lot of guilt that I missed an entire week with her. And then when I got home, I couldn't still be that mom that she had known before. Mm. She was so little that she won't remember, but I will. And I think that's what's really hard. Yeah, I, uh, Jamie, the first person that I talked to here on the podcast also talked about survivor's guilt. But, and he also had like uh, two children, right? Who were in the car when it happened to him. But also here with you, like, I can totally understand or see how feeling guilty or feeling like that survivor guilt. Because you're the mom, right? You want to be there for your daughter, but you can't or not at the same level as before this. Yeah. That must be super hard. Yeah, it was incredibly hard. But at the same time, it was just such a relief to be home with her because the whole time Mm -hmm. I was in the hospital, all I was thinking was, what Mm -hmm. if she me and she never even knows who I am yeah ah uh, yeah that's a super painful thought right yeah yeah she would have never known me yeah how many how how long were you in the hospital so it was a, a week yeah. yeah I see like it hurts a lot still right when you think of this oh yeah I mean it's uh Like I said, it still feels very raw and it still feels Mm. fresh. I mean, a year has passed, but Mm. I still feel very much stuck on that day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A year in the end is nothing for this. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. And I think I'm still a little bit in shock too. You know, it's like still, like I said, I just can't believe that out of nowhere, right? It's sudden. It just comes out of nowhere. And you're like, what happened to my life? Mm. <laughs> In an instant. Yeah. Because did they, do they know why it happened? So they, like I said, they did the cardiac catheterization. Um, they yeah. had some suspicions that it was something called coronary vasospasms. And the way they explained it to my husband was basically that my heart, it was kind of a perfect storm of things. Uh Caffeine, not taking care of myself, some prescription medications that I was on that make your heart go faster. Um, And my potassium was really low. So they think it was a combination of things. But basically what it caused was one of my heart valves completely collapsed on itself. They said when Mm. it's like when a water hose kinks and water can't get through. Yeah. Mm. And that's the best way that they could simplify it for my husband to understand. So there was no blood pumping to my heart and my heart kept spasming. And it kept causing me to go into the recurrent cardiac arrest. Um, so because of this, because they they pretty they said it's extremely rare. They don't know much about it. Um, it's just a. It, they said it was really just a fluke thing that was a perfect storm of events, and they don't think that it'll ever happen again. So because of that, I did not get an ICD. Um, they oh, you are, don't have one? No, I don't have one. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, oh, hmm. I know that's kind of my thought too. Um, they are treating it with calcium channel blockers. So I have to take four um, calcium channel blocker pills every day. And also when I got sent home from the hospital, they sent me home with nitroglycerin. 
and with the instructions that I have to carry it with me everywhere I go. And wow. if you go unconscious, it has to be administered immediately mm-hmm. while 911 is called. Um, so yeah, I don't have any freedom. I mean, I, I constantly have to have, I'm, I'm taking medicine all day. I have to carry emergency medicine with me. Um, and, and to my knowledge, I don't know if they ever talked to me about an ICD. I don't remember. And I didn't even know what one was until I joined the cardiac arrest survivor. Right. Mm-hmm. And then I started getting worried. Like, why didn't I get one? You know, it, it kind of, it makes me nervous that I don't have that backup. Yeah. Right. I mean, I'm definitely no cardiologist, so I don't know the strain, the, the, the chain of thoughts on why they didn't decide to do that. But I thought it was almost like standard protocol to, insert that in someone who has cardiac arrest yeah but apparently not okay Uh, yeah because that's a lot of medication right it is and he said to me at one of my follow-up appointments he said you're going to be on this for a very long time and so that that's kind of been their plan of action and i've read the hospital notes and they really feel confident that that's the best way to treat me considering what the prognosis was and everything but I've never asked him about an ICD because I, I haven't seen him since I kind of started doing research on them, but I definitely plan on asking why wasn't that an option or, you know, was it even thought of? I'm sure they thought of it, right? Yeah, they, yeah probably. Yeah. whole panel of people working on trying to mm-hmm. figure out what was wrong with me because it was such a rare case. Um, mm. But yeah, I mean, I don't know. The medication just, is not per se chronic. It's not like for the rest of your life that you have to take this. I don't know. You don't know. I have no idea. He just said a very long time. Yeah. What does that even mean? Right? (laughs) Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. Mm. Cause how are you feeling like today? Like after a year now, after having gone through everything and after uh, taking this medication, like how do you feel today? I feel that's such a loaded question, right? Yeah, Um, I know. (laughs) So physically, I feel okay. Um, you know, I, I don't have, I don't have, um, the chest pain anymore, obviously from the compressions, but I tell you what, that lasted a very long time. I mean, I'm a small girl and my husband's, you know, strong and those compressions, that pain lasted for a very, very long time. And the fact that I have three rounds of compressions, that was really hard to get over. Um, Hmm. I have physical pain today. Sometimes I still get just chest pains, um, which I think I'm more sensitive to now since everything happened. Mm. Um, and then emotionally, not good. I, I, not I can't good. say I'm fine. Um, yeah. I'm yeah. Very, I have a lot of PTSD. Um, it has affected my entire life. I mean, I, I feel like it defines me now. Unfortunately, I hate saying that, but I feel like it's all I think about. It's mainly what I talk about. Um, Mm. I have really not done well as far as recovering emotionally. I, uh, I don't really leave my house. Uh, and if I do, I don't go alone. I tried to go out by myself after about six or seven months and I ended up having a terrible panic attack in the store. And I remember thinking to myself, who looks like a nice person that I can tell what happened to me and tell them if I pass out, this is what you have to do, you know? Um, and I just felt so vulnerable. I was grocery shopping actually, and I put everything back and I left the store because I just couldn't, I couldn't do it by myself. And after that point, I've just been too afraid to go out alone. Um, I'm afraid to sit at the house by myself with our daughter, because of course I think, what if it happens and no one's here to take care of my daughter? Yeah, those are real concerns, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, she's still, you know, she's a year, almost a year and a half now, but she still very much needs me for everything. And so I will tell you the truth. I don't have a lot of independence. Um, I, I have people constantly with me. Um, they have to force me to get out of the house sometimes and say, let me take you to the store just to get you out a little bit uh, because I don't feel comfortable driving by myself. I don't feel comfortable going out. It's been really, really hard. I am very much not the same. No. I'm so sorry to hear this. Uh, and I can understand, right? Because this happened 
differently, but it happened to me as well. But this fear that it could happen anytime again yeah. is a real fear. And it's better for me now, but in the beginning I had so much fear to go on, to travel somewhere uh, or to be yeah, alone. I do have to say like having the ICD does feel good to have because it is my safety net and you don't have that, right? So I can definitely understand that it is even scarier than uh yeah mm. yeah and i and the thing is too you know if i were to go unconscious again no i mean someone has to be here to give me that medicine that nitroglycerin or right else yeah it's gone. so that's been a really like you said i don't have that icd backup and so i constantly live in a state of thinking it could happen at any time that's not a good feeling at all no yeah and you can't keep living like that, right? Because then you're going to be very isolated yeah, I already, from life. Yeah. And, and it's crazy because when you come out of something like this, you want to live your life again. You're like, I have this chance, right? But I feel like I can't. Yeah. Mm. Because I just live in fear constantly to leave my house. And mm. I don't even want to be away from my husband because he's the one that saved me. And I'm like, he knows exactly what to do if this happens. I want to be with him at all times, but he has to work. And, you know, he can't, he can't be by my side. He needs to live his life. So a lot of family over all the time. Um, they have to help me out with my daughter still because physically, I mean, I, I get tired a lot more easily now. I don't have the same um, stamina I had before. I don't sleep well ever since it happened because I'm afraid to die in my sleep. <laughs> and yeah, no nope. yeah right mm. um so you know yeah i don't i don't have that same quality of life that i had before i used to be such a outgoing person who loved to go out and do things and i've lost that <laughs> sorry it's okay like <laughs> i really feel you here <laughs> it's really okay yeah yeah it's just really really hard to to lose your independence as an adult yeah you know yeah, we live like in a world and we're like, you're still very young, right? And I'm as well, but we look all both, like you look fine like this, right? From the outsides, but no yeah. one knows how it feels inside and the things that we deal with, right? Yeah. And it seems like everyone that I've talked to so far feels the same. Like there's almost no emotional support in this. We're just like thrown out in a world that expects us to be fine, but we're not. Yeah. And you hit the nail on the head when you said you look fine because yeah. what, they say, well, you look okay. You should be okay. You should mm. be it now. You lived. Be grateful. Yeah. And of course, I'm grateful every second of every day. But people, mm. people don't understand what it does to you emotionally. Yeah. There's a cost to surviving. And that's one that people don't know when they look at us and uh I'm, I'm i like like you said i have heard so many people tell me like oh you must be so grateful and yeah i am but this costs there's really a cost that i paid for for being here still and sometimes it even made me question <laughs> yeah i don't know if this was yeah worth it or something like it's different for everyone, right? But um, again, I am grateful, but it's been an emotional roller coaster in so many ways that it's been really heavy for me and it's been really heavy for you, right? Yeah, well, and part of what's been really hard is every time I tell someone new my story, like if I go to a new doctor's appointment or something like that, or, or when I see the nurses or cardiologists who treated me, I'm told time and time again, you're a miracle. We can't believe you survived. How are you yeah. still? And it's so great to hear that. But at the same time, it just puts into perspective how close you were to not making it. And constant, I don't know, it just messes with your head knowing that I really shouldn't be here. So many people don't get this lucky. And, you know, it's, it's why me? And then you think of all the what ifs. And like I said, you know, what if? I never came home to my daughter and I'm not even that old. You know, I have my whole life ahead of me and I could have lost it in an instant. And I don't know, that thought never leaves my head, you know, and I, yeah, mm. he passed it. 
but gosh, it's hard. And everyone expects you to just go on with your life and not think about it. Just don't think about it. But how do you not think about something that is so momentous in your life? I think about yeah. it. Of course, right? Yeah. And there's not many people like us, right, who survived a cardiac arrest. Yeah. Which is good, right? But it makes it also hard and lonely because we don't have a lot of people to talk to. Yeah. Uh, and, well, I'm really grateful for the support group on Facebook, the Cardiac Arrest Survivors group. Me too. If I hadn't found that, I don't know. I, I was at such a desperate low point that I just thought, let me just search on Facebook and see if there's anything. And then I found that group because it's the only place where I can feel validated, that I'm not alone in what I'm feeling. Um, sometimes I'll have a thought and then I see that someone else asked a question or posted about it. And I'm like, okay, what I'm feeling is completely normal. And um, it's just so nice to have that support from people who get it. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. It, it has made me also realize how important it is to have a support group. People that you can talk to who have been through this too, because those are in the end, the only ones who will truly understand, right? Yeah. It, it sounded like you have a great support group around you, but they, well, they have not gone through this, right? So to a degree, they will never understand completely. It's uh, so, yeah. Yeah. Groups. yeah, I think they get tired of hearing me talk about it, too, because it's really hard right. for them. sensitive subject for them. You know, they lived it. I, I don't remember how horrible it was, but they do. And so many times over the past year when I just really needed to talk about it, they say, we can't talk about it. It's too hard for us to talk about it. But for okay. me, talking okay. about it is, is therapeutic. Um, yeah, yeah. And... Yeah. You know, they just, they can't because they realize that they almost lost me. And so I have the most wonderful support system, but I don't want to hurt them and make them keep reliving it either. You know, I mean, my poor husband, what he had to go through, I can't imagine. He thought he was going to be a single parent. I mean, he really, I was, I was gone. So I don't want to make him keep, but. At the same time, I've had so many questions. And like you mentioned earlier, your memory is not the same afterwards. So I feel like I ask him questions over and over again. And so he's constantly having to think about it and talk about it. And that's really, really hard on him. Doesn't it help him somewhere a bit too? Because he, he went through something different, but it's something that you both shared in a way, right? Yeah. But you both got the other pieces of... <laughs> of the, the whole thing in yeah. in a way, right? Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, he he does talk about it. He never shuts down and says, I don't want to talk about it. But it's emotional for him. It, it, I mean, he, that was, he said that's the most scared he's ever been in his entire life. And, um, you know, I mean, I, I can't imagine if roles were reversed and that had been me, I can't imagine how I would feel. Um, but... I make sure to tell him all the time how heroic he was and how I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for him because he kept his cool and he knew just what to do. And I'm so grateful for him. Yeah, what they have to go through is very traumatic too, right? Yeah. Uh, especially if it's someone close like like you, right? His wife, uh, a loved one. Damn. Yeah. yeah. What would actually... What would... What would help you like emotionally to feel a bit better? Are there things that you think if that could just be a little bit better, it would be a bit easier? You know, I, I, I've thought about that because I say to myself, I don't want to be sad for the rest of my life. Um, and I've been in therapy uh, and you know, it's good to talk to someone who has to listen to me say it over and over again. Uh, but, you know, of course they want to put you on medicine and it doesn't, it doesn't take it away. So I, I haven't even, I don't want to take medicine. Um, and that's part of, part of what's been, is I was on medicines before this happened. I don't want to be on anything now, really. Sure. Yeah. Um, but you know, therapy, it, it is helpful to a degree. Um, I don't know what the answer is. I think time, maybe just the more that the more time that passes, maybe it'll just kind of heal it. Uh, 
Yeah, time and maybe more answers on what happened to you and how to better manage this. And yeah, sure, time. It's been really recently that this happened in the end, right? A year is nothing for this yeah. to to just emotionally <laughs> grasp what yeah, it, it, the effect it has been on your life. So time, in a way, does, I think, because it's been now two years for me since I survived mine. Mm. Time emotionally makes it better, but it's still a roller coaster. Um, everyone now that I again talk to also said that that like recovery never ends, that you're like a chronic survivor. There are always ups and downs, and it's really scary to also hear that, right? That oh wow, it's never gonna be the same again. Yeah, but it's a bit like Corona. You know, we were always saying like, oh, when are we going back to normal? But there is no, there's a new normal. Yeah, yeah. And I do think time, knowing better tools on how to manage all those aspects that you need. Well, that, yeah, you need to, uh, to tackle in a new way. Time can help to find answers on that. I, I, I do think that. But in the beginning, it's so rough. Yeah. Yeah, you're in hell. And and yeah, yeah. Amy said in the last podcast, they don't give you a, a survivor's guide. They don't send you home and say, here. This is how you manage it. I mean, you just go home and you figure out your new life. And it is it is just insane. Yeah. Yeah, I, I doing this project and talking to other survivors has been personally like very healing for me actually. It made me really less lonely in having gone through this and having and still going through this, right? Um, and it seems to do a lot of good to the people that I talk to as well who survived it. Uh, to finally just talk to someone who, yeah, understands it more. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, how was it actually to listen to another survivor for you? It was really nice. I mean, yeah. just to... And, and I'll tell you what's helped me out too is in that group when I see people post about their 15 three birthday or their 20th three birthday. And right. I think there are people who have made it that far past yeah. it. You know, sometimes they'll even say, I didn't even know it was my rebirthday until someone reminded me. And I, hey, I get to that point where it's just another day. And, mm. um, and I don't even look back on it with any sadness or anything else, except for just complete gratitude. Hey, my apologies for interrupting the conversation. It will just take a moment. If you like the conversation so far and would like to support the Heart Warrior Project, check out the truly awesome looking t-shirts and mugs I created together with an illustrator for fellow Heart Warriors. My goal in creating the t-shirts and mugs was to create something that would help me feel more empowered in the battle that surviving this cardiac arrest has been and, well, still is in many ways to show not only the world, but also myself, the heart warrior that, that I have become. And by offering the t-shirts and mugs on the Heart Warrior Project, I too hope that it can help fellow cardiac arrest survivors feel empowered too. The mug has become my go-to mug. I, I drink my coffee from it every morning and my tea throughout the day. Also, the t-shirts I personally love so much that I ordered more than a couple of them myself. I frequently wear one throughout the day and uh, certainly you can see me wear the t-shirt when I'm out climbing. I can only say this, have a look at the t-shirt designs and the mugs. And if you like what you see, I tell you, you won't regret ordering either the t-shirt, the mug or both of them. Not only will you have a fitting mug and or t-shirt for your current lifestyle, but you'll also be supporting the Heart Warrior Project and help me to continue doing this. In the description of this episode, you can find a link that will take you to the page where you can order both the t-shirt and the mug, or you can also go directly to heartwarriorproject.com to find it. All right, thanks for taking a moment to listen. Now let's return to the conversation. Is there something that you wished your cardiologist would have told you sooner or something that you discovered now that you wished you, would, you, you discovered sooner that you might recommend to any other survivor listening? The only thing I can say is just ask, ask all the questions, even if you feel like you're annoying your doctor. I mean, you have to ask 
advocate for yourself. And I, I know I, I bring a list of questions in with me that, things that pop up over time that I'm like, oh, I want to ask him about this. Um, and I take notes because you can Google all day long or you can listen to other survivors, but my case is unique to me. Nobody's story is the same. So I need to hear it directly from the person who knows. And so, yeah, I mean, I just asked, like I said, I'm going to ask him about the ICD this next time. I have an appointment next week. And Oh, good. I'm, okay, that's soon. Yeah, do you think that I'll ever need one of those? Or, um, you know, I mean, there are just so many questions that I feel like don't be afraid to ask You're right. your, your cardiologist or whoever. Um, you deserve to know the answers. Mm. Yeah, um, yeah, but definitely ask about the ICD for sure. But also let him know what's emotionally happening to you, you know. Because yeah. uh, I also discovered that having a second cardiologist, like someone who has a second opinion on your case, has been really helpful. Like I did that in the last uh, last year that I went to another cardiologist, and they both have different looks on my case. But yeah, both good things that they are sharing, but both mm. different things a lot of times. And yeah. maybe for you as well, it could be good to just go to another one for a second opinion. Yeah, I've thought about Because it's complex, right? This is it really is. complicated. Yeah. They might know a lot, but it's so compli complicated that it might be good to have just two opinions. Yeah, I agree. And that's something I've thought about and done some research on too, trying to find the best cardiology hospital in the United States and see mm. if I can get a second opinion from them. Um, and at some point I probably will. Yeah. I really feel it's been a really helpful thing for me. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. Is there, you know, is there something that helps you when you do feel like emotionally down or sad or lonely? Is there something that you do that does lift you a little bit up? For me, it's playing with my daughter. I mean, yeah, yeah. she doesn't know it, but she has saved my life this past year because mm. even on my hardest days, I still had to get up and I had to be mom. And otherwise, I would have just laid in bed all day and just fallen into a deep depression. Yeah. But she has been my saving grace because it brings me so much joy. And I thank God that I have her to get me through the darkest moments. Yeah, it gives like such a significant kind of meaning to get up. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I can truly see how if she wasn't there, it will be a completely different story your life. Yeah. yeah. She's my greatest source of joy and the best therapy. <laughs> yeah. So... It's uh, it's been really. I'm very blessed that I have her, um, and of course my husband too, and my family. I mean, dad, I can call them and and spend time with them. Um, that's really been helpful. And then, like I mentioned earlier, just going on that uh, survivor group. I mean, it's been so beneficial for me, more than I can say. And I'm just so grateful that that I have that support as well. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah, meaning is definitely something that I also discovered for myself is something that helps me to get up <laughs> when I feel down uh, or just tired emotionally from all this. Uh, it does push me forward. And I could definitely see myself also just laying in bed all day if I wouldn't have some kind of meaning or reason yeah. to stand up. Yeah, I think it's easy to fall into that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because I do feel not the same like I used to before all this. And I think uh, almost every survivor has that, right? Yeah, I I refer to it as my past life. Um, because yeah. person, that life, that's done. That's not that's not my life. That's not who I am anymore. And I, I say anyone who knew me prior to that day, they don't really know me anymore. Because I don't even know who I am anymore after that happened. Mm. So, yeah, it's... Uh, it is really a rebirth, right? <laughs> yeah, it really is. That that yeah. life is not the same. Yeah. For so many years, we kind of knew who we were. And then this happened. They were like, fuck, who am I now again? Or how do I go in life, you know, with this new person that I'm sort of now? Uh, 
Yeah. Is there something actually when, you know, you did share some things, uh, but is there anything more that you feel is very difficult to communicate to the people around you who have not gone through this? Just that I'm in a constant hell in my own mind and I wish I could escape it, but I can't. And again, I hear all the time, even from my family, but you're alive, you made it, you know, just be happy, just be happy that you made it. And I wish they understood that it's such a complex feeling that I am happier than I've ever been, right? I'm more grateful than I've ever been. But at the same time, I'm in hell um, emotionally. I am I live in a constant state of fear. I'm always feeling so many emotions at one time. It's never just as simple as I'm just happy today or I'm just mm. sad to be here. It is so complex. And, mm. and, and you try to explain that to the people, but I, I know they don't get it. How could they get it? Nobody could get it. Um, but I just wish that, you know, constantly hearing that, well, you should just move on now. You should put it behind you and you should move on. It's not helpful because yeah, there is no moving on. <laughs> There's no putting it in a box, putting it away and forgetting it. I wish that that was the case, but it's not. This will, this will live with me forever. Hopefully for a very long time. <laughs> Yeah, how would you describe the hell that you're actually in? How? I just, uh, I'm haunted. I'm haunted by the what ifs. I'm haunted by the whys. Why me? Why did I live? Um, and I think when I read statistics, it just really hits home for me. When I know how lucky I have lived, it's like, it's really hard to, it's really hard to grasp that. And yeah. You know, like I said, I, I'm, I'm always afraid. I'm afraid to sleep. I'm afraid to be awake. I'm afraid to leave my house. I'm afraid to be alone. I'm afraid to drive. I'm just constantly afraid. And, you know, everyone says, well, you got to get back out there at some point. You got to live your life. And hopefully I will. But it's still, like you said, a year is nothing. This is fresh. This is a new, a new wound. I mean, I, I'm doing the best I can every day. And I wish that people knew that, that even if I'm crying, that's all I can do. That's the best I can do that day. Yeah, really. It's just that we look so fine, right? From the yeah. outside, that's really the biggest thing that's like standing in the way for people to connect a bit more deeper with us in like understand like, oh, they're not fine or they're still like definitely struggling with all this. Um, yeah, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, anyone can post a picture of themselves smiling, right? But you have no yeah. idea what's behind the scenes. You have no idea what, you don't know someone's story. Hmm. Yeah, and I, like I am, of course, really grateful with cancer, for example. There is so much awareness about it and people really know the suffering that they have to go through. Yeah. And thank God, right? Because it's a horrible thing to have to go through. But I feel sometimes with the cardiac arrest, people here in Belgium just don't seem to know what it is or they don't know what the journey is like. And I feel like there's less awareness on this topic yeah and people when you say cardiac arrest people associate it with heart attack and they don't understand ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. our heart stopped we were yeah, gone. Right? very and different yeah i don't think people understand that like we were gone yep um and so you're right there isn't there isn't much awareness and i'll be honest before this happened to me it meant nothing to me if i heard a story yeah. i didn't get it Same. um mm -hmm. But now it's like, yeah, there isn't much awareness. There isn't, people don't understand the difference between cardiac arrest and heart attack. And when I hear a story about someone dying from cardiac arrest now, my blood runs cold. I, I just, I'm like, I survived that. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I love bringing awareness to it. I mean, it, it's awesome. Yeah, and I'm really grateful that, that you did take the time for this because you are a drop in the whole <laughs> ocean, right? To bring awareness on this topic. And uh, your voice voice will matter and help many, many people, I, I, I think. Uh, and all we can do is, yeah, try to bring some awareness on this topic that definitely deserves way more awareness because the chances of surviving it, yeah, it's, it's, so, it's so low, yeah. It's really hard to grasp for me when I see the numbers because I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. 
they're low numbers, but I, I, I don't know what the feel is sometimes on it. About I know. It. it takes my breath away. I just yeah. no. I, I, every time I see a statistic, it just, I'm like, you know, it just, it takes me aback because I'm like, how am I so lucky? Yeah. Yeah. Brooke, I have one last question for you. Um, what is the best tip that you could give to a survivor? Or is there something that you still want to share to anyone listening who just recently survived it or who is in general just a survivor? I would say give yourself grace. Allow yourself to feel the feelings, even the dark, terrible ones. Um, talk about it as much as you feel you need to. Uh, lean on this support group, um, therapy can help a lot of people, I think. Um, but just really allow yourself to feel those feelings. Um, don't try to bury them mm -hmm. and just act like you're fine and act like nothing ever happened because it'll catch up to you. Um, I think at first when I came home, I was in a little bit of denial and I don't think it had fully hit me yet. Um, mm -hmm. but once I started to allow myself to process those feelings, I mean, it's hard. It's really hard. But in a way, you have to. You can't bury it. You can't ignore it. It happened. And you have to learn how to live with it and manage it. And so be patient with yourself. Um, a lot of times I get mad at myself and I say, you should be better by now. You should have you passed it by now. But there's no timeline, right? There's no guide. Um, I'll get past it when I'm ready to get past it. But in the meantime, I'm going to allow myself to to process it how I know how to and um, talk about my feelings and just do the best I can every day and find things that, that do make you happy. And even if there's just one little moment in the day that brings you joy, hold on to that. How do you feel right now, actually? It's, you know, it's just really hard because I think about all the ways that my life has changed. Mm. I mean, I mentioned to you earlier, I can't have caffeine. <laughs> I know that's yeah. a thing but like as a new mom not being able to have caffeine was awful um you know I, I don't know if I'll be able to have another kid in the future which was always part of my plan wow yeah I lost my job <laughs> because, so it's just um it's it it really affects your life and I think that people like you said people would look at me and think I'm just fine but I'm not fine at all. Um, you know, people think about the right now, but me, I'm thinking about the future and what is my future going to look like now? And I don't know, you know, the future that you planned out is just in an instant, it's changed and everything that I had built for the past, however many years, you know, I've lost friendships because of this, because people don't know how to talk to me. They're afraid of saying the wrong thing. So they don't say anything at all. Um, I feel like a lot of people turn their backs on me because they just, you know, people don't want to hear you be sad all the time. People don't want to yeah. hear your trauma all the time. So they just stop asking how you are. Um, so, I mean, I just, I would tell people buckle up if you've been through this because it's, it's, it's a hell of a ride. Um, hang on tight. <laughs> Do you feel somewhere also angry? Oh Yeah. I'm so angry that this happened to me. Um, you know, I'm a good person, right? Like, I'm sure we all say that to ourselves. Like, I'm a good person and mm. I'm kind to people. And I have always been so grateful for life. And, yeah. you know, why me? Why did this happen to me? Why did it have to rock my world? Yeah. Um, you know that I have so much anger. Um, I think I've gone through every emotion, grief, anger, denial. Mm -hmm. I haven't gotten to acceptance yet. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, that anger is so, and you don't want to live that way, right? Like you don't want to be angry every day, but like, damn it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Why? Why did this happen? Yeah. It has upended my life. I mean, you know, life was going up just fine. My life was perfect before. I liked that life. And that life is gone now. And so, you know, you go through a, a mourning process of. Yeah, like, you do. Yeah. Yeah, you do. Yeah there's nothing fair about this it's yeah it's just completely unfair 
and it happens to good people. Yeah, but then you feel bad even saying that because you're one mm. of the lucky ones that live. So, yeah. you, you know, and I feel like a lot of times I, I don't allow myself to feel that way because I'm like, you shouldn't be mad. You're one of the lucky ones, but I am. Yeah. You, you, it's very okay to be mad. You have every right to be mad, right? On this, because it's just not fair. Yeah. And I can get that, yeah, this feeling of, yeah, you should be grateful, can stand in the way. But it's actually standing in a way for you to heal in a way too, right? Yeah. Because you're sort of like trying to push a, an emotion away, which is anger or any other ones, while... Yeah, again, you have every right to be angry on this about life and why why you. Yeah, and I feel like it's changed your it's changed my personality because I'm I'm less patient, I'm more irritable than before, um, and I hate feeling that way. Um, yeah. you know, I'm more sensitive, but I, like I said, I'm just doing the best I can every day. You are, yeah, you are, yeah, yeah, you are truly an incredible example to me of someone who is a heart warrior, someone who is fighting, even though it's anything but easy. Yeah. And I have a lot of respect for you that you're doing that. I know yeah. this is not going to make it better, right? <laughs> no, but thank you. I, I appreciate that from someone who gets it. And, you know, we're just, uh, we're all on this journey together. We didn't want to be here, but here we are. <laughs> Yeah, here we are. Exactly. Yeah. Brooke, um, thank you. Just this has been an emotional conversation, right? Thank you for yeah taking the time to do this. Um, definitely at some point, I would love to do a second round with you. There's so much, you know, on this topic that we could still talk about. But thank you already for taking your time for this episode and for being so vulnerable and real it yeah i yeah it helped me actually a lot too good well thank you so much and thanks for what you're doing because this is going to help a lot of people who are in our shoes yeah i hope so and that's my intent of course uh but yeah you're a part of this so thanks <laughs> thanks yellis and that concludes yet another episode here on the podcast of the Heart Warrior Project. I do hope you gained some support from this episode with Brooke and that you gathered some useful tips or advice to apply to your own life. Now in the show notes located in the description of this episode, you can, as always, find any resources mentioned in this conversation, such as the Facebook support group, for example. Um, also, if you want to leave uh, any comments, thoughts, or feedback, you can also do that in the show notes. As well, on the website of the Heart Warrior Project, you can find uh, some other additional articles to help you cope with being a cardiac arrest survivor. So if you need some more help, definitely take a look. With that, I thank you for listening, and I hope to welcome you again sometime on another episode here on the podcast of the Heart Warrior Project. This is your host, Yelis Fass, signing off. Before you go, i uh, just like to remind you of the Heart Warrior t-shirts and mugs I've created together with an illustrator. If you're looking for a fitting t-shirt or mug that will not only show the battle you fought and are still fighting, but also something for yourself to wear and use that will make you feel empowered. These t-shirts and mugs will be a great addition to your life. It certainly has been true for me. Additionally, you will also be supporting the Heart Warrior Project, which will help me to keep this project running. Now, if the t-shirts or mug doesn't speak to you, but you want to support the project, we also accept donations. You can find more info about all this by going to the description of this episode. There you can find a link to where you can order the t-shirts and mugs, as well as other ways to support this project. Or you can go directly to heartwarriorproject.com to find this information.